Welcome back to On the Middle East. My name is Ambrin Zaman and I'm our Monitor's Chief Correspondent based in London. There's been an alarming spike in anti-Semitic attacks in the UK since Hamas attacked Israel on October 7, killing over 1,200 Israeli citizens. Israel struck back with ferocity, engaging in actions that have been labelled war crimes. The attacks against the Jewish community in Britain are the worst in modern times. Britain's estimated 280,000 Jews live mainly in London and Manchester. The country is seen as among the safest in the world for the Jewish community. So what has changed? I spoke to Dave Rich, Policy Director for Community Security Trust, a watchdog that monitors and records hate crimes against Jews in the UK and with Andrew Apostolou, a British historian who closely follows the Middle East and Jewish affairs worldwide. Welcome to our programme, David. It's great to have you with us. Thank you. It's great to be here. So, Dave, um, it's a very fraught time, of course, for your community and... You are tracking uh, these incidents uh, of harassment, of the community, of the threats, and we'd like to know what the state of play is, what is actually happening right now. So at uh, CST, the Community Security Trust, we take reports of anti-Jewish hate crimes and hate incidents across the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, most of these reports come to us directly from victims, witnesses, family members, from security guards at Jewish community buildings. We also have uh, information exchange uh, programs with police forces around the UK. And we've been doing this work since 1984. Uh, last year, 2023, was the highest annual total we'd ever recorded, 4,103 anti-Semitic incidents across the whole of the UK. Um, this was a 147% increase on the year before, and it was by quite some distance the highest annual total we'd, we'd ever recorded. We've never recorded more than 2,500 incidents in a single year, and last year it was over 4,100. And if I tell you, two thirds of all those incidents happened on or after the 7th of October, then that is a, an indication of just how much the uh, Hamas attack on Israel on that day and the subsequent war in Israel and Gaza has had an impact on the levels and the type of uh, anti-Jewish harassment uh, and abuse and threats uh, in the UK. And I should stress, we don't accept every report of a potential incident into our statistics. We always look for evidence of anti-Jewish targeting, anti-Semitic language or imagery, and around 30% of the potential incidents that get reported to us don't make it into our statistics because they don't meet our criteria as being anti-Semitic. And that includes a whole range of different types of things, but it does also include kind of standard pro-Palestinian anti-Israel uh, activism which doesn't use anti-Semitic language, it doesn't directly target Jewish individuals or Jewish community locations, so we don't include it in our statistics. So this spike uh, immediately after October 7th, I mean, the fact that it was so immediate, does it suggest that this was already bubbling under the surface? Because let's not forget what happened on October 7th was a brutal attack on Jews in Israel who were killed, uh, you know, raped, tortured, um, abducted. So what, what, what does that tell us about that, the reaction, Look, the nature anti of it? Sure, anti-Semitism has always been there. It's something the Jewish people, Jewish communities have lived, had to live with for centuries. And we know it rises and falls. It comes to the surface at times of stress or when, you know, Israel is, is, is at war. We always see these big spikes in anti-Jewish hate crime. Uh, we saw it during the last conflict in, in Israel and Gaza in May 2021, the time before that in the summer of 2014, and before that and before that. So we know it always happens, but the usual dynamic is um, conflict 
that is always bubbling along in Israel and Palestine flares up, it escalates, Israeli forces move into Gaza um, and start bombing targets and so on. The media and social media fills up with distressing images of dead and injured Palestinians from Gaza. And this then triggers waves of anti-Jewish hatred around the world. It's not excusable, it's not rational, it doesn't really happen with any other conflicts, but that's normally the dynamic. And, and I think we've sort of lapsed into assuming a, a sort of rationality to the thought process, even though it's not an excusable response. What happened this time was different. As you say, what happened on 7th of October began with this unprecedented Hamas attack on Israel, the murder uh, and kidnapping and rape and so on of huge numbers of Israeli, uh, mostly civilians. And the anti-Semitic incidents in the UK began immediately. Uh, the first one that we recorded that made direct reference to what was happening in Gaza was at lunchtime on October the 7th. And that day we recorded three times as many incidents as we had the day before, and then it escalated from there. And actually, the days with the highest in number of anti-Semitic incidents were in that first week following 7th of October. The weekly total that week was the highest week of the year, highest week we've ever recorded. It wasn't, as you might imagine, that the incidents started and then they built and built and built as the number of Palestinian casualties increased as the Israeli army went into Gaza, it was the opposite. They started at their highest peak and then they stayed very high and they are still, the number of incidents we're getting recorded to CST at the moment is still two or three times where it used to be before 7th of October, but it started to decline as Israeli soldiers went in. It was the opposite dynamic. And what this says to us is we're dealing with people and this is a minority of people, it's not so much that they are angry about Israel and they're taking that out on Jews. These are anti-Semites who use the conflict in Israel and Palestine as a trigger and a mask for their prejudice against Jewish people. And when Israel is at war, when Israel is in the news, when the media fills up with these images, it excites anti-Semites to see Jews in Israel being killed. It's a horrible thing to say, but I think that is what's going on. And it encourages them to literally join in. You know, we had one incident that I, I feel summed up the kind of thing that was going on. It was a day or two after, 8th or 9th of October, an ordinary Jewish family walking down the street and some stranger who drives past or walks past shouts at them, the war is starting, free Palestine. And he shouted that directly at this, these Jewish people simply because they're Jewish. They've been singled out because they're Jewish. And it's almost like this individual wanted to join in in his own way with what was happening in Israel and Gaza. It's, it's you know, it's an appalling thought. Most people look at that conflict and, and are absolutely horrified by the amount of suffering and death and destruction and just want a, a peaceful solution. But there is this minority of people who look at it and are actually excited by it and want to kind of lend their support. So, I mean, is there a particular profile of such people or i mean is it impossible to pinpoint it's complicated broadly speaking it's mixed you know when people report uh, an incident to us and most of the uh, anti-semitic incidents we've had reported to us they're not violent it's mostly verbal abuse it's people shouting in the street so we ask the, the victims or the witnesses can you describe the person who shouted threats at, to, at you or abuse because we want to give those descriptions to the police so from that, we get a rough breakdown of age, a rough breakdown of gender, and a rough breakdown of ethnic appearance. Now, in a normal year, when there's no war in Israel, around 60%, 55 to 60% of incident perpetrators, where we get a description, are described to us as being white. And the rest breaks down between South Asian, Arab, North African, Black, and so on. When Israel's at war, that flips and you get 40%, maybe even as low as 30% described as white. And the majority then are described to us as primarily North African or Arab appearance than South Asian or black. Now, 
we can read into these whatever we want. You know, some people will read into that and say, well, that that reads across to mean Muslims. I don't think it's that clear cut. Jewish people live in the most diverse areas of Britain anyway, London, Manchester, urban areas where the population is very diverse. There's a lot of polling showing anti-Semitic attitudes are more widespread amongst younger people than older people in Britain, which is another problem that we're only just waking up to. And the younger population is more diverse. So there's lots of things that can feed into this. But broadly speaking, when Israel is at war, you get a different profile of anti-Semitic incident perpetrator, shouting abuse on the streets, posting stuff online and so on. So this raises the question of, you know, do such people at some point organize? I mean, we saw a lot of people go from Britain to join the Islamic State in Syria. Um, so one wonders whether this, because it's a, it's sort of a, a tectonic shift, isn't it? What's happening in the Middle East currently with this war is really like, a, 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 yeah, a inflection point. Is that a concern? And are you working with the authorities? And are you also working with uh, Muslim community leaders to address this issue? You know, like, uh, are they working on sermons that would calm people down, that sort of thing? So I think when it comes to the actual hate crimes, it's much more organic and uh, kind of self-starting than being organised. In some ways, that's even more worrying because the numbers are so high and it's just emerging from 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 the ground up where we have seen a lot of organization is extremist net uh, influencers and extremist networks focusing on specific individuals or organizations to target for a combination of online pylons threats in uh, you know threatening phone calls and emails and demonstrations focusing on particular individuals especially those who have any connection to the Israeli army or the Israeli government. So dual national British Israelis who've done their reserve duty in the Israeli army and then come back to Britain, that kind of thing. And, and they know they these people. That's kind of scary that they well, would know of such You know, people. there's been a couple of cases where people in that position have then come back to the UK and done a talk for example, oh, to a Jewish audience. Okay. Well, there was one involving a university student chaplain who was a dual national. So you got a lot of organised, uh, very threatening, very abusive activism, but in a focused way. Now, we do work very closely with the authorities. We work very closely with the police anyway on all the counter-terrorist security that we organise. Because as well as the hate crime work, a big part of CST's work is physical security at synagogues and Jewish schools and other Jewish buildings and so on. We work very closely with the government. Uh, the government pays for a lot of um, commercial security guarding in Jewish communities, and we work with the government to distribute those funds to Jewish buildings. And we do work with, there's a parallel organisation uh, called Talmama that monitors anti-Muslim hate crime in Britain. And we actually advised them when they established themselves about 10, 12 years ago, and we work very closely with them. And since 7th of October, we've been in regular weekly meetings with the director of Talmama, who's a Palestinian woman, and with police forces around the country to monitor the levels of hate crime, the levels of community tension, because this conflict is proving to be incredibly divisive, um, not just between Jewish and Muslim communities, but divisive in, across society in general. It's influencing the way that politics is happening, the way that elections are happening, in a way that no other foreign conflict that Britain is not a party to ever does. It really does have a, a unique social and cultural and political impact in Britain, and I believe in other countries too, in a way that no other overseas conflict does. Well, we saw David the phenomenon of David Galloway being uh, elected and Surely that must be alarming to the community to see that I mean, they, dynamic in play. Yes, there, there were specific unusual circumstances around the by-election where George Galloway got elected because the Labour candidate was stepped down because yeah. he said something anti-Semitic <laughs> in a meeting. Yes. But effectively, one way or another, the conflicts in Israel and Gaza influenced the outcome of a parliamentary election in the UK, which is 
astounding if you think about it. Of course. You know, it, 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 things tend to happen in more conventional ways in general elections. So we'll see what happens when when that comes. But I think it is alarming for the Jewish community to see just how different the reaction to Israel and Gaza is to any other conflicts, even other conflicts with larger losses of life and, and so on. And you see that in the size and frequency of the protests in the streets. You see it in politics. And of course, most worrying of all, we see it in this huge spike in anti-Jewish hate crime. We saw the headline in the Evening Standard the other day claiming that Jews are fleeing Britain. I mean, that is clearly an exaggeration, isn't it? And and Britain is still a, f a, f a fairly safe country for Jews to live in, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? It is, yes. Look, every opinion poll shows that in terms of the population as a whole, Britain is less anti-Semitic than most countries on Earth. And I think broadly speaking, if you look at British Jewish life, in recent decades, certainly, it's actually one of the great success stories of the Jewish world. It's a very successful, comfortable, happy community. And yet we get these outbursts of anti-Semitism that really do leave people wondering what the future holds and whether Britain will be safe for Jews in the future. But I think that's probably a conversation that's happening in every country, in every Jewish community. And I think, you know, Jewish people have been very anxious, worried, frightened since 7th of October, but also there is an inner resilience in the community where people are connecting with each other in a way they haven't done before. A lot of Jewish people actually going out and, and you know, for every Jewish person who's hiding their Star of David necklace now, there's someone else who's bought one for the first time and is wearing it out and proud. And, you know, I think we will get through this. I, I, I think there is a lot of worry in the community, but I would take stories about people leaving in significant numbers with a big pinch of salt. I mean, where would they be going? As you say, it's pretty bad worldwide and, and, and Israel was the safe haven. And of course, right now it's everything. But thank you so much for speaking to us today. And I hope this, you know, we leave all of this horror behind us very soon. Thank you. Welcome to our programme, Andrew. Thank you. So you're a historian and you've followed Jewish life in this country very closely. Can you give us an idea about, you know, the community in Britain, the background? Absolutely. So the first thing to say, actually, is when it comes to the Jewish community, there's really no such thing. There are people who identify as Jews. There's around 340,000, according to the census, but they're divided into many different groups. Some people are without any religious affiliation or identity at all. They just don't practice. And some people are extremely religious. And in fact, that's all they do. All they do is is study and, and, and follow the religious dictate. So it's a very broad range of people. Um, I would say the bulk are what are called traditionally orthodox. So these are people who keep the two main tenets of Judaism today, which is keeping the Sabbath keep, you know, and the holidays and also keeping kosher at home. And then there are people who um, are don't do that because they're reform. And then there are people who are very, very religious and they just study all day and this kind of thing. So it's a very broad range of, of identities in terms of religion. The only ethnic differentiator in the Jewish community is between the Ashkenazim, who are the bulk of the community. They're people whose families are originally from Northern Europe and the Sephardim, whose families are from the Mediterranean and the Middle East. And Sephardim have very strong sense of different Jewish identity. Um, the community is mostly in London and in Manchester and in place, uh, a few other places, but it's an urban community now. There's a very few Jews left in Scotland, uh, very few in Northern Ireland. There are some in Wales. Um, and so I think what's really happened in recent years is you've had, you know, the community has been affected by the volatility in British politics. So, you know, one of the big things in British politics at the moment is in, actually it's Americanization. So you have wedge issues, you have culture war, and you have identity politics. And that's really hit the Jewish community. So, you know, we have English nationalism with Brexit, we have Scottish nationalism, and now we have, 
you know, people asserting a kind a so-called Muslim identity in the UK um, and people who are becoming very Jewish. So that's the big elephant in the room, isn't it? Um, the Muslims in this country. Um, it's totally politically incorrect, probably, to, 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 to even raise the, the question. But um, what I'm hearing is that quite a few Jewish people feel that the growing number of Muslims in Britain has has fed into anti-Semitism that obviously already exists and indeed among, you know, Christian white uh, British people as we see in the United States among uh, white American people on the far right. Um, what, what, what do you think? Do you think that that's made a difference? No, I don't actually. I think it's a, an error. Um, what's happening is, again, th what's interesting about Muslims and Jews is how similar they are not just religiously, but in the fact that these communities are very diverse. I mean, in the Muslim communities, you know, so-called Muslim community, again, you couldn't really use the word community. What's the big differentiator? It's ethnicity. If your family was originally from Bangladesh or your family was originally from Kurdistan, that's a huge difference already. You know, if your family is originally from Iran or from uh, Suriname, a huge difference. So there's a huge diversity. I think there are what's happening as part of that identity building in British politics. There is a small minority of people who are quite radical, who feel that creating a so-called Muslim political identity is very important. And Palestine is the issue they can coalesce around, because if they talk about Kashmir, they start arguing with each other. But supposedly, they think they can unify around Palestine. The only problem, of course, is if you mention Palestine, guess what? The Kurds and Iranians say, we don't care. And the Turkish Cypriots say, why are you ignoring us? So it turns out not to be a unifying factor. So I think this is actually a minority pursuit. Um, and it's being used by people in Britain as a way of distracting from the fact that, you know, a lot of the anti-Semitism in the UK is actually coming from people who are British originally British. Their families have been here for a very long time. Um, and I always say my joke about Europe is the last thing you need to do is import anti-Semitism in, into Europe. <laughs> well, yeah, not really a joke even, is it, given what's going on? But um, don't you think, though, that Gaza is, is a big factor in the spike we're seeing now? And of course, who is sensitive to Gaza, if not the Muslim community? I think absolutely Gaza is a correlation with the rise in anti-Semitism. It doesn't necessarily cause it. Um, a lot of the activism around Gaza is not related to anti-Semitism. Some of it is. Um, but I think there's also a parallel process happening here, um, which is that, you know, you also have a rise in Britain of anti-Muslim sentiment along with anti-Semitism. And that is coming very much at the moment from the political right, such as the Conservatives. And I think that's one of the reasons why, interestingly, and again, out of the headlines, not noticed, the two groups in British society that have really been engaging with each other and doing a lot of interfaith work and community building have been Muslim and Jewish groups. And that's why groups like the CST cooperate with groups like Tel Mama, which is the anti-hate uh, group for Muslims. Um, because actually, intellectually, the roots of anti-Semitism and the roots of so-called Islamophobia are very similar. They both draw on very similar ideas that that the out group, whether it's Muslims or Jews, are inimical, inimical to Christian civilization, that they are alien, that they are going to corrupt our society. And, you know, I always say the people today who are very anti-Muslim, they are actually the lineal descendants of the anti-Semites of the 1930s and of the 19th century. They may portray themselves as pro-Israel and pro-Jewish for political reasons, but intellectually they are the heirs of anti-Semitism. So yes, there is an issue with some people saying that, you know, I can express my identity by being, you know, very virulently anti-Israel and also anti-Semitic, but it applies to many people and a lot of the people on these demonstrations aren't Muslim. And I think actually, again, there's a generational issue. Um, if you look at the the original generation of Muslim migrants to this country in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, that generation was very non-political, very much keen on integrating into British society. It's a younger generation and a minority of a younger generation who feel homeless in a way culturally and spiritually. They don't feel connected to what their parents felt connected to, but they also feel rejected by the UK because of growing anti-Muslim hostility. And, you know, 
one thing that radicalism does for everybody in every circumstance, and it's happening in Israel too, by the way, is it gives you a home. It gives you a purpose. So how do you think the government is handling all of this? I mean, and the media for that matter, because there seems to be a kind of hysteria around this subject now with the Evening Standard claiming that there's an exodus now amongst of Jews. It's, it's quite alarming the way they frame this issue. So I think there is genuine alarm uh, among Jews in Britain for the simple reason that the whole purpose of Israel is to act as a haven for Jews and a protection for Jews. And October the 7th was a massive failure on that regard. So the one place where you're supposed to always feel safe as a Jew isn't. So that's a, a, a rational response to say, well, I'm obviously scared by that. I'm scared by the anti-Semitism. But Britain is still very safe for Jews. We have very good communal organizations like the Board of Deputies, which are uh, has an electoral legitimacy to it. We have the Community Security Trust, which does very rigorous, very careful work on anti-Semitism. I think the Evening Standard headline was that they were taken in by an organization that campaigns, but is not particularly serious or rigorous, called the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism. With regard to the government, I think they're stuck in a very difficult position because, you know, one of the major extremist forces in British life at the moment, frankly, is the Conservative government. I mean, you have a prime minister and his former Home Secretary who were very openly targeting Pakistani men. Um, you have a problem of anti-Muslim bigotry in the Conservative Party. You, it's a party that also is very bigoted against immigrants, even though, oddly, immigration is the only thing keeping the British economy going at the moment. So the government's in a difficult position. You can't really credibly fight racism if you use it yourself for political ends. And you just had to listen to yesterday's budget in which the Chancellor of the Exchequer kept saying he was against migration. Well, you know, when people hear that, they get hostile to both migrants and the descendants of migrants. So I think the government's mishandling it, frankly. Um, but that's, again, part of the dynamic that leads to the extremism we see on the streets as well. I mean, the why Labour not be an extreme? The on the other hand, seems to have gone through a period of a very um, right. energetic, let's say, self-criticism, reflection, and flushed out a lot of these anti-Semites from within its ranks. Ab right? Absolutely. So we, we had a political crisis in the Labour Party, part of which was to do with anti-Semitism, and that crisis is largely over. But now we have a political crisis in the Conservative Party, um, over which direction they're going to go in. Are they going to become like the American Republicans, which in a sense, they're very tempted to. I'm not sure it's a good idea for them. Or are they going to go back to being a kind of moderate, nearly centrist, kind of fuddy-duddy British party? Um, are, are they going to go or are they going to go in the direction of Orban, which some of them want to do? Um, so there's this crisis in politics. And within that crisis, um, I think you have these these different trends and remember also it's not just um uh, among some muslims that you have this issue you have this issue among some hindus in britain we have the you know people who support modi and extreme anti-muslim prejudice there uh, we have some extremism also obviously in in scotland um we've had instances of other communities having problems of extremism there, there are certainly problems i think to be honest within the jewish community i think there are some people very open about that there are some people on the far right of the Jewish community um, who quite like these kind of anti-Muslim things. Um, and I think the mainstream, however, rejects that. So every community has to sort through its own problems. Um, but as I said, I think um, the most interesting thing for me is that sensible people uh, who are Jewish and Muslim recognize the commonality of interest and they recognize that actually, you know, the, the strength of Britain is in being a plural society. Remember, the second biggest religious group in Britain is atheists. <laughs> so um, and well, the, the biggest religious group is, is people who claim to be Christian, but probably aren't. <laughs> well, on that note, Andrew, thank you so much for giving us this My pleasure. stories on of uh, Jewish life and history in the United Kingdom. And let's hope that this awful war ends, um, you know, tomorrow, if not now. Thank, thank you. you very much, Amber. My pleasure. And this brings us to the end of this week's episode of On the Middle East. I hope you found my conversations with Dave and Andrew as enlightening as I did. Do tune in again to On the Middle East. Thank you and goodbye.